much fun. This is, we're down to the last two of our art discovery. And today is the art of the West. So we've lined up some of the best of the West right here. Um, on that end, we have Randy Galloway, who um, hails right here from Cape Creek. And uh, next to him is Kurt Matson, also a Phoenix native, or not a native, but resident. And next to me is the lovely Sarah Fippen from Colorado, Frutia. Frutia? Sedalia. Who lives in Frutia? I don't know. We'll find out. So Sedalia, Colorado. Did I say that wrong? Fruta. <laughs> I make up words. So, and I'm Susan Coget with Celebration of Fine Art. And uh, we're happy to have you here. So this should be, um, you're, they're barely going to need me today because these three will have lots of stories. I may need to rein them in now and again. Never, never need to rein us in. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to learn about how the West inspires art and why you guys chose that as your uh, media or your your style so um i would like to start with randy and um you've got a great little background so first share a little bit about your background how long you've been painting sculpting and then we'll dive into the real stories after we do the intros well i'm uh, getting to be an old dude now but i uh went to school got my degree in graphic design and had a double degree so i had a painting and because I knew that I someday wanted to paint and ended up uh, spending 35 years as art director and worked in different places around the valley and had my own design studio. And then when I hit 55, I decided to cut it off and start painting. So that's when my so painting last career year? started. Yeah. Last year? Okay. So, yeah. So uh, I'm turning 70 this year. So I've been at it for 15 years. And when I hit 65, I had the hots to try sculpting. So uh, I came to this show the first day and instead of having my my canvas up, I brought some clay and wire and did my first bronze. So that got me going on that. So now I bounce back and forth and I'll do a painting and then I'll do a sculpture. And so it's been a great thing to revive me and keep me going. I'm Kurt Madsen, and I grew up in the horse business. So my background, I worked ranches from California to Alberta. And we showed cutting horses, reiners, all that stuff. So I bounced around all over the West, and I wore lots of different colts, really good ones and not so good ones, and really got to learn, in terms of cowboy art, what it was really all about. Because there's so many things that people don't know about what it is to be a cowboy, what it is to be a good horseman, what it is to do all of this kind of thing. And so by the time I was 27, I was running a ranch up in Northern California. I'd knocked around all through California, Oregon, up to Alberta, met my wife in Alberta, which was the best thing that happened in the whole thing. And then uh, I ended up back down in Oregon. I was riding some colts there and then went down to uh, end up running a thoroughbred ranch. And when I was 27 years old, and when in 1979, uh, we had gone back to the, we used to show for the world, we'd show to comp compete, then we'd go back to Oklahoma City for the world championships. And when I went back there one year, we used to go, you know, every year, but then went back in 79 and went to the Cowboy Hall of Fame, which is what it was called in those days. And you walk in and the first thing you see is end of the trail. And that's the big uh, plaster of the Indian on horseback and he's, you know, sloughed over with the air or with the uh, uh, spear. And I thought, oh man, then we walked into a permanent collection and there was a drawing by a guy named Edward Boreen. Now Boreen was an old Californian like me. Boreen was known for etchings and watercolors and he was fantastic. So for three years that, or four years, that stood around in my head. And by the time I was running this outfit, it was working for 600 a month and 10% of stud fees. So I was making big money. I thought I was just wealthy as all get out. But you know, here's what happens. Most horse trainers end up broken and broke. And I figured in the art business, I might be broke, but I won't be busted up so I can stay horseback. So I started to model and try to get into some sculpture at that point. I knew nothing. And I was very fortunate because when I came off of that ranch, the first guy I met was one of the top sculptors in cowboy art. I followed him around at a show for about two hours. I know he thought, who is this guy? 
I finally got up enough time to talk to him. He mentored me for four years, and then I would take workshops. And that's how it all started. That was 40 years ago. And so that's how it went from Kevlin into the art. And now to be able to tell the stories of the West and of what it's really all about is really my big passion. And I get to do both. We get horseback and we get to do art. So how good is that? And what's your name? Trucker. Trucker. Trucker's okay. my boy. He's such a good boy. Oh, good grief. <laughs> I could tell you stories about Trucker the rest of the day. He's probably watching from well, his stable. You know, Wendy may have out there because she knows she watches all these. So we may, Trucker, uh, he, may, he could easily be doing that. All right. All right, sir. Follow that. Let's hear about you yeah, and your horse's name. Um, my horse is Cheyenne, actually. But um, is it on? Yes. Okay. I just have to be closer. All right. So, yeah. So I grew up sort of partially alongside the art world as well as in alongside a ranch. So my parents bought a quarter of a quarter section off of an original homestead in Colorado. And they said, we want our children to grow up with some of the same things we did, which means we need them to learn some responsibility and we'll have animals and that'll teach them responsibility. We kids said, oh, lots of furry friends. And that worked out just fine, actually. Oh, is it not working? Is that better? Uh-oh. Really close. Is that, is that better? Okay. So, um, yeah, so, so the lots of furry friends did teach us lots of responsibility as young people. And I think my mom was very brave. She, that she, we, if we got all our school stuff done or whatever, and we'd go out and we would just ride the horses in the afternoon. And she trusted, we'd go out on the neighbor's ranch and she trusted those horses to bring us back or to come back empty. And then she'd know to go look for us. <laughs> and, so, and for the most part, they brought us back completely intact. Sometimes we'd come off in between, but, and that was really, you know, it was a really freeing way to grow up. So, and that was my freedom all the way up. Getting a car was like, no, that meant I had to be an adult and go do errands and things because the horses were where the freedom was. So it was, it was completely different. I had a horse and a cow before I had a car. Horse, cow, and saddle before I had a car. Yeah. So anyway, and cars, by the way, are such a ridiculous thing because if you're on a horse, you've got like radar because they've got extra ears. They can see all the way around. You know, you've got all these things. You get in a car and it expects you to do everything including the, your, I mean, you're talking about something that has no sense of self-preservation. So how is it going to know to get out of the way if you don't notice a thing? It's completely ridiculous. Yeah. So anyhow, so yeah, grew up with a lot of different animals. We had a milk cow and we raised chickens, sheep, goats, not so many goats. Um, but, you know, we just did, we did the homestead thing. And now we still do a lot of gardening. And all of my artwork ends up coming out of what I love about what I'm doing at the moment. So in, rather, I haven't delved nearly into the history of it the way these other two fellows have. But what I've done is coming from, like, my connection with this garlic is really strong because I grew it from a tiny seed. Like, that's, no, it, it's really, it's kind of crazy. But, you know, it's that kind of a, it's more relational on that aspect and the way the cow's personalities come out and the way you do end up with interspecies relationships with, uh, you know, between the animals, between even like plants and the landscape and, and all of those things end up winding together in ways that I don't even know how to talk about yet, which is why I'm rambling. So give me a chance, keep talking to me, keep asking me questions and eventually I'll figure it out. We'll talk more about your art on the next round. Because you do, you do come from a legacy of art artists too. That will be interesting. Okay, so again, I probably don't need to lead much with you, you all, but um, Randy, you have been fascinated with both Native American and the Western cowboy, and you go, you have. I'll, I'll let you just do your thing. I was going to ask you questions, but you, you got a plan there, so go for it. Well, um, I grew up in New Mexico. And in the 50s, there was the Native American influence everywhere. All the women wore the crushed velvet and the beautiful turquoise jewelry. And we, my parents would take us as kids to their friends' houses down on the Rio Grande to the nice old adobe homes. And they would have chili parties and play cards all night. So uh, I was exposed to all this beautiful stuff that the Native Americans had done. And I was always around the rodeos and the cowboys and all the stuff that was 
happening around the West there. So it was always in the back of my mind. And um, a lot of my inspiration now comes from photo shoots that I'll go to. I go back to South Dakota and I go up to uh, Montana for the crow and the black feet and uh, travel around different places. And I've probably got about 13, 16,000 incredible photos now from all of these different reenactments and people that I've met. So I really enjoy the fact that all of my artwork, that these are all real people and people that I've met and get to know them. And I usually give them a print of the painting when I'm done so that they have that to remember their time when they were modeling. And uh, I have one here just to show how sometimes my inspiration will start with a photo, then I'll research it and find out all about what was going on. Other times I'll read something and then I'll set up something at the photo shoot to go with what I read. So what I have here, I pass around the photo of a uh, Ooh, something to look forward to. So this is a this is a bigger shot of it, and so at first it looks like oh big deal, you know, it's just a, a young girl, and uh, she's got her bucket in her hand. Well, there was this article that was the inspiration behind this. And this was a book called American Indian Stories. And it was published in 1921. So it's 101 years ago. And uh, it was by Zikala Saw. And she was renamed Gertrude Simmons by the Catholic missionaries. So she grew up in that transition period where they were. Uh, trying to assimilate all the Indians. And that's why I grew up in, in, in New Mexico. If you go to the Herd Museum and see all those exhibits, that was like the 50s when I grew up as a kid in Albuquerque. And so uh, a lot of those kids were on the track team. The Indian kids were good runners. And I was a runner, so I got to, to hang around with some of the Indian guys and got to know them a little bit. Because they always hung by themselves. They ate lunch together. They hardly ever spoke any English, but they could understand it. So they knew what was going on. So when we were joking around, they would laugh along with us. Well, uh, getting back to this one, the um, Sitkala was the first Sioux woman to write the stories and tradition of her people. And it was published clear back in 1921. So this is a little excerpt that will give you an idea of how you can get excited about uh, painting something like this. And usually I'll do a write-up like this and give it to the people when I sell them a painting. And they'll put it in a frame or keep it in a notebook and they have it as a nice uh, verbal explanation of what I was going on in the painting. So this starts. A wigwam of weather-stained canvas stood at the base of some irregularly ascending hills. A footpath wound its way gently down the sloping land till it reached the broad river bottom, creeping through the long swamp grasses that bent over it on either side. It came out on the edge of the Missouri. Here, morning, noon, and evening, my mother came to draw water from the muddy stream for our household use. Always when my mother started for the river, I stopped my play to run along with her. She was only of medium height. Often she was sad and silent, at which times her full arched lips were compressed into hard and bitter lines, and shadows fell under her black eyes. Then I clung to her hand and begged to know what made the tears fall. My total, my highest possible speed, with no little bit of setting loosely clad and spreaded with a pair of soft moccasins on my feet. I was as free as the wind that blew my hair and no less spirited than a bounding deer. These were my mother's pride, my wild freedom and overflowing spirits. She taught me no fear save that of intruding myself upon others. Having gone many places ahead, I stopped painting for death and laughing with glee as my mother watched my every moment. 
I was not very conscious of myself, but was more keenly alive to the fire within. It was as if I were the activity and my hands and feet were only experiments for my spirit to work upon. Returning from the river, I tugged beside my mother with my hand upon the bucket I believed I was carrying. One time on such a return, I remember a bit of conversation we had. My grown-up cousin, Waka Zalian, who was then 17, always went to the river alone for water for her mother. Their wigwam was not far from ours, and I saw her daily going to and from the river. I admired my cousin greatly, so I said, Mother, when I am tall as my cousin Waka Zalian, you shall not have to come for water. I will do it for you. So that could be the painting and could be the title right there. I will do it for you. So then the people have that hanging on their wall. They have friends come over and they read the title and they go, what's this about? And then they can pull out the story and then it just is enlightening and, and you know, magnifies the beauty of the painting a thousand percent. Wow. That was fantastic. I'm going to say Taylor Sheridan doesn't have anything on you. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's better than a movie or a miniseries right there. Yeah, if you've all been watching 1883, it's really why I love the West. It's just fabulous. You know, it's got everything in there. But that, that uh, transition time there, the 1800s, there was so much going on in the United States with the white men and the Indians and all the, the uh, clash and the moving West and the bravery that it took to get on a stagecoach and get all the way out here. Amazing. What a treasure. Now, tell us again the, the book that came from, please. This is, this is called American Indian Stories. If you want to look that up, you can get it on Amazon for almost nothing now. But I was just amazed that it was published in 1921. Yeah. You know, and uh, she had gone on to school. She was taken out of the... Uh, the reservation and, and raised in white education, went to school, got a degree, and, and she wrote a, uh, a Native American opera. It was the first thing she did in 1913 because a lot of the Indian stories were passed on through a song. So she thought that would be the perfect thing to make an opera out of the Native American songs. And then this was stories she wrote, and so it has a uh, different chapters in it. It says here, one of them describes a uh, tribal justice after a murder. And another one is, uh, uh, she was curious and a shrewd woman who risked everything for her husband to be. So different, diff different stories, interesting. Wow, again, what a treasure paired with your beautiful artwork. So thank you for sharing that. We might have questions about that later from our yeah. audience, but. You want me to talk about this one up here? Are we going back to that? Go ahead, yeah. Okay, for so this one. Okay, we, this is we, one. You started one. that here, right, Randy? That was that was a blank canvas. Yeah, yeah. This is my few weeks ago here. So uh, I love this shot because of where it was. I love that rock and the, the bluff behind it. And I didn't know if anybody else would really like that or not. But uh, while I was painting that, uh, and a customer came in that was an archaeologist. And he went crazy over this. And he knew all of the land formations, the dates, and all this stuff, you know. So I was like, great, somebody else really likes this. But uh, this is a, a, no, he didn't get it too bad. But uh, this one is depicting a uh, Lakota Sioux woman. And her outfit is just absolutely gorgeous. And you're wondering, well, why is she down at the river wearing something like that? Well, they usually made their encampments along, along the river so they could always get water. So they were close to the water. And so this kind of an outfit could take two to three months to make. So uh, all the beading on there and all the tassels and everything, it's slow going to make something like this. So she would have that on for special occasions or uh, ceremony. So what I'm figuring is there was a ceremony going on at the camp, and then that's winding up, and so she needs to take her horse to get some water. So she takes off her leggings and her moccasins, because those can get ruined in the water. She wanted to cut her feet off, 
So she walks her horse down, takes the saddle off, and walks the horse down to get some water. And so that's how she ends up uh, along the edge of the river there, in such a beautiful outfit. But uh, the things I like to look for when I'm going to photo shoots is that the people have uh, pretty authentic outfits on. And the guy that makes this, his name's Kevin Meadner, and he's been doing this for years and years and years. He's Cheyenne, and he's an expert on everything to do with the Sioux and the Cheyenne. And he put this all together, and a lot of times he'll make replicas for museums. And then he does a photo shoot once a year to make some extra money, because he knows the artists, so eat this stuff up. So we pay him a fee, and then we pay tips to the models. And so she's got on a fully beaded outfit, and uh, she has a, a, a choker made out of dentalium, which is a shell that they would trade for. Comes from the, the coast, and so it has beads and dentalium, and then her necklace. I haven't done the detail on it yet, but it'll be beads and hair pipe. And hair pipe was another thing that they had made out of. Sometimes it started with conch shells, and they would uh, whittle those down and make their cones beads out of them. And then it, uh, they found out that they could make those out of the bone. So there became a whole industry that they would trade for. There was a lot of things that the Native Americans would trade the white men for. So the white men wanted the pelts, started with the beaver pelts, because there was a huge industry in Europe for that, and then the buffalo hides. So they would trade for all these beads and things that the white men would bring over from the coast. So there was one guy that had asked one of the traders if they could make those in quantities for them. So sure enough, there was some people back in Chicago that had a wave and would make them out of bone and bring them and trade them to the Indians so they would have hundreds of them. So then they'd make these beautiful elaborate outfits that went all the way to the ground with just tons of this hair pipe. That's these long white things here. And then she's got a, a, a fully beaded uh, knife sheath there, and she would have uh, bracelets on that were made from uh, wrapped glass. And uh, the horse has a, a German silver bridle, which was popular back then. This would have been like 1870 to 1880, somewhere in there. So it kind of fits in with the timeline of the, the show 1882, when they were first starting to move out west here. So I'll get this all finished. I'm a stickler for details. So I love this kind of stuff. But you really get into the water. You know, there's nothing more beautiful than nature. So I try to recreate that as close as I can to getting all the nice little waves and stuff. And there'll be a splash coming up here. I, I really like this, that she had one foot down in the water a little bit. So that's fun to paint that uh, distortion there with her foot. And the other foot's just taking a step so it's shiny and you know what. So, those are fun little things to do. This, I had a blast. This is like a hundred abstract paintings put together to make something that looks real. Because if you get up close to this, it's just one abstract painting after the other, and it's all done with a palette knife and scraped on there. So please come up and take a close look at it when you're all done. Thanks. Wow, that's great, Randy. Thank you. Thanks. Woo. Yeah, those shadows and the archaeological detailing and the water. Fabulous, thank you. So, okay, let's move a little bit more from the Native American into the world of the cowboy and the vaquero. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Mr. Matson. Well, you know, if when you talk about cowboys, you should be able to tell, now this goes back, if you go all the way back to Russell's era, you should be able to tell where a cowboy's from by his gear, okay? It's, you can tell what region they are, you can tell what era they are because saddles change, horses change, gears, gear changes as well. There's some consistencies, but there's a lot of things that are different in a different era. So when you look at like this, I'll use him for an example. This guy here, this particular, he's called Dress to Impress. Now, this is a vaquero. This is 1840, which was the golden age of the vaquero. It was 1800 to 1850. If think about it this way, when the gold rush started in 1849, everything changed and it changed overnight. And in these years, 
a vaquero, now we get the word buckaroo from it, okay? The buckaroo is a cowboy from California, Oregon, Nevada, Southern Idaho, Western Utah. Most buckaroos, are, you can tell they're going to ride slick pork saddles. They're going to shoot rope with an 80-foot rayata. They're going to have eagle calves sometimes. Sometimes they'll have manel stirrups. Lots of silver because you know you got to have silver. What it is, it's, a, it's pride in your horsemanship. Now, over here in Arizona, you got cow punchers. Now, cow punchers are handy guys, but they rope with a short rope. They typically use modified association trees or Will James trees, which are a swelled tree. They've got shotgun leggings, which is the kind most of us kind of associate with uh, cowboys. And they'll ride like with a lot of Marlboro Man hats, okay? And then you go to Texas, and you've got brush poppers, and you've got taco hats. There's a whole different thing there. And then you come up to Colorado, up into Wyoming and Montana, and it changes again. You get combinations. If you will look at, at uh, the Charlie Russell paintings, you will often see buckaroos whooping cows right next to cow punchers. The reason for that is that there was a big cow die-off in 1886. Almost all of the cattle in Montana were killed during a, a, a really bad winter. They had to reestablish those ranges. What that meant is they brought cows up from Texas and they brought cows up from Nevada and California. So you'll see guys in his paintings, one guy with a centerfire saddle, you know, flat hat like mine, a big old eagle bill taps and lots of silver, laying an old rayetta on, with, on, a, on a cow with a cow puncher right up there who just headed him. And he's got shotgun leggings and he's got a double cinch saddle and there's a whole difference there. When you look at this guy, you can see the Spanish influence of the uh, vaquero. These are called tapaderos, okay? They're the precursor to what we have today. They cover your stirrup so your foot doesn't get, it's protected from the brush. And these days they were flat and they were uh, tied onto your stirrup leather. The stirrup on this guy, and you can see it if you come up, I'll turn him a little bit. Those are four inch wooden stirrups. They would have carved those themselves, okay? That rayetta is a 60 foot to 80 foot rawhide rope, okay? Then they would have, now remember this, uh, they made this stuff themselves. Most of the vaqueros uh, and most of, the, of this era were making the gear themselves. Okay, this is called a bow top right here, wrapped around the lower part of your leg. It was a precursor to what we have as shafts. Typically, they were rawhide, and they would tie onto the leg. And then inside that, on the right side, if you're right-handed, on the left side, if you're left-handed, there's an 18-inch skin and knife. Because what happened during this era was that cattle were valuable for hides and tallow, and so they took, they would skin the cows, and then they would take them down uh, into the bays, and those would be shipped down around the horn. So you've got the botas, the little short tent. Again, this is very Spanish. If you ever look at Charlie Russell and he's got a red sash around his waist, that comes from the vaquero. You can see it right here. This guy's got it tied on. The short jacket, again, very vaquero there. And then you can see this guy's got a flat crowned hat. When you see the flat hats, and sometimes in, these, in this era, you had a lot of round hats, although there were flat hats like mine. These were all very Spanish as well. This all comes from the mission era. And then this particular saddle is which is a slick fork, meaning it doesn't have any swell. So it's at least we call it an A fork sometimes. And so they have no swell on it. What they were was a saddle tree with a cinch hooked onto it through some latigos. Then it had a piece of leather called a mochia, and it just sat over that saddle tree. And this is called a guerra, and it protected the horse's hip and it was also decorative. And then you can see on this. All the silver conchos up here on this bridle, okay, he made that all, he would have made that himself or traded for it. This is a Santa Barbara spade bit. There are several different cheek pieces. A spade bit is a signal bit. And it, what it does is it lays on a horse's tongue. And so when you train them, it takes it five to six years to make a spade bit horse, to make a finished bridle horse. But you train them in such a way that you're not yanking on their mouth. You start them with what we call a bosalita or bosal, heck of is the, for the whole rig. Then you two rein them and you come into a final uh, stage, which is your straight up spade bed horse. There's a whole thing there, which I won't go into now, but this is a finished, really nice horse. Signal bits are, these are rain chains. These are braided rawhide. He would have made those as well. So all of the gear you see on this guy, including those spurs, now they were trading for some of these things too. But the vaqueros of this era made an awful lot of their gear. And then you can see the guitar in the back. Here's what's going on. If you were a vaquero and you're, it's 18, 1838, 
and you see the senorita that you'd like to court, okay? Well, in those days, if you were going to court her, what you could do is if you, if you uh, ever get over to California, you'll see some of the old rancho houses, they're old adobes, and they were typically kind of little two-story affairs if the ranch was uh, of any size. Well, they would have a patio around them. And so you could go and serenade this girl that you were sweet on. But there was a chaperone up there with her because you can't get too fresh, you know. And so he's practicing his singing as he heads over there. Now, he would have typically had that Rayetta tied on back here. But you see, he's planning on success. So he's moved it up here because if they say, say if she's impressed and she gets the approval, she gets to go for a ride on the back of the saddle. So there's a, all of that is going on in that piece. And to this day, if you are in Buckaroo country, you're going to see the different leggings, the slick fork saddles, all of that stuff, flat hats like mine, all of that is influenced by these guys. It all came over from Spain. Wow. Woo. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> We're, this is this is what we call a master class in uh, in art history, in Western history, and um, fantastic. And if you anything you need to or want to know about horse and history, Kurt Matson is your guy. Another thing, I'm going to put a plug in for our Museum of the West in downtown Scottsdale. One of my favorite parts of that museum is the bits, bridles, saddle, and spur. Yep display because it 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 you can visualize everything that that kurt was talking about yeah when you go to, if you get over there and, and do take the time if you're in town go uh it's from abe hayes abe hayes one of the major collectors of, of cowboy gear in arizona for years and they got a, se a selection of saddles and bits and things like susan was saying and when you look at those saddles you're going to see all these differences in them they've got a great old walker in that collection and walkers were a real early slick sport real popular in California. Uh, so you'll see all of that in all of these distinctions. You'll see when you go through that, uh, that collection is great. Yeah, so yay, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to my friend right next to me, Sarah, who um, what I love about what we've represented here, we've got some great history, Native American, cowboy, bring us up. And Sarah, you really celebrate the West of today most of what you're painting and sculpting would be contemporary of the moment. And uh, behind us, we have a great painting of yours. Yeah, is this on now? Okay. Yeah, so um, that is true. Yeah, I found, I found that the, the West still goes on. It's a little farther away from the road. Sometimes you have to find it, but it is still here. People are still working cattle in very similar ways. They're there's, still, there's terrain that is suitable for horses that's not suitable for ATVs and other ways of doing things. Uh, there is terrain that's not suitable for horses that you have, need to have dogs or maybe drones. But, you know, it's one of those things where the, you know, it's, it's not, for me, it's less like the West is in the past and we've moved beyond it. It's more like it's a base layer. And if that's healthy, if the way we interact with our animals and our environment is healthy, then you can build on top of it. If it's unhealthy, uh, you know, you might eventually, eventually you might notice. But it's one of those things where, you know, you want the people who are growing your food to have good empathy with their animals and to be able to see when their ear drops. They're like, oh, this one might be a little off today. Or is that one a little lame? Like, can we, can we head these things off before they get worse? And so those, that's the kind of, you know, thing that I kind of grew up with is, you know, really knowing your livestock well and knowing that that's not just unique. That's, that happens a lot because the people who raise cattle, they usually like the cows. You don't get into that without some amount of affinity for the, for the livestock themselves. And you want them to do well and you want to see them doing all the cow things. And so it is fun to see the, the way those things have interacted from the past to now. And one of them is rodeo, because all of our rodeo stuff, most of it, there's a couple of exceptions, um, you know, comes out of things you would have done on the ranch. No, you wouldn't have necessarily been breeding your bucking stock so that it could buck bigger and better and maybe uh, be wilder than it would have been. But you would have had to ride those horses out and get them trained and get them settled so that you could do your work on them. 
And now, you know, now we're taking that to a, you know, to an entertainment degree. And that's, you know, what I loved about this shot, which was at just a little backyard rodeo um, in Colorado. And I loved for one thing that the, the shape of this, this gray horse, the white horse here in front, he's got all of this muscle and power, but he's in restraint. You know, he's, he's got all that power, but it's held back just a tad because what's going on is the cowboy on the, um, the saddle bronc there is just about to, to leave his bronc ride. He's had a successful ride. He's ridden through it. There's, you know, everything went great. He's probably got a really good score. He looks pretty pleased with himself. He's ready to lean over and catch the other cowboy and swing off into the arena. And the, the dark horse is still bucking hard. He's just coming off of a big buck. He's out of control. So that, that juxtaposition of in control and out of control with the same animal. And very often these, very often these, um, these, uh, these other cowboys' horses, the, I'm drawing a blank, pickup guys' horses, Often, yeah, they often have horses that are similarly bred to those bucking horses because you need rank to handle a little bit of rankness. You know, you've got to have a horse that's going to handle that kind of an environment and, and that little bit of wildness in order to, to make it in that situation. And so that's, I really loved the, I loved all of that about that piece. I do too. That's so good. And you also um, have alluded to how much you love nature mm -hmm. and, um, some of the best cow paintings I, I've ever seen are in Sarah's studio. Um, herds of cows, single cows hanging out. Um, and you really combine that with the beautiful settings in the landscapes that you pr present. Um, yeah, because they work well together. And, you know, much of this country has been in pasture of some sort, whether it was the you know, the native grasslands that the bison were going across. And in many ways they created that because otherwise it would be all forest. If you don't have something eating down, it will be all forest. And so, you know, thinking about how, how those things work together, I don't think you can get, I don't know. For me, it's like every landscape is somebody's home. I'm always looking for who lives there. Is it the prairie dogs? Is it the native grasses? Is it the little things that you can dig up and eat? Is it the, you know, the animals that are running across? Cross it and all those little dramas that are interwoven together is really, you know, it's fascinating to read that. And the, the wonder of this earth, I, it's just, it's fabulous. And how did you go from the, the ranch world that you lived in to art? Um, I, they were in tandem my entire life because my grandfather was George Fippen and he, he was set out to be the Remington and Russell of this area and doing very much accurate cowboy sculptures and paintings. And um, he passed away before I was born. And, but I came down pretty early on to help my grandmother run the little art shows. At that point, they were smaller. They are not small, not at all. But um, I saw artists making a living at this. And every year we'd come down, help set up the hospitality for the artists. And I would, you know, saw the quick draws, saw the tents go up, saw the artists presenting their work. And over time, it started to think, you know what, I could probably do this too. And so that's where, that's where I got my, my beginning as well. And your uncle? Is... Yeah, my uncle Lauren was um, instrumental in getting my first bronze cast. I didn't even know it was done <laughs> until he shows up with two little solo cups of rubber and says, we're going to cast your horse today. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so, yeah, so then, you know. Pretty soon, that's that's kind of addicting, isn't it? Did yeah. you say that's addicting? Okay, it is. Yeah, and Lauren's such a good. I've known Lauren for thirty-five years. He used to come into a place where I worked and waited tables, and you do a good imitation. Well, we're gonna cast this. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't say funny. no to Lauren, right? No, 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 no. And no. he always it just says, spoils the fun. You just are along for whatever he's got planned. <laughs> he says it with his great little smile that you can't say no to. So, yeah. Um, but again, I love how you. And all of you really are bringing the, the beautiful West, historical and present, through the, your eyes to all of us, the viewers. And um, what has that meant to you? You know, Randy, like you, you left your other career to become a fine art artist that you brought your ideas to life for other people to enjoy. Yeah, it was really a, a, a kind of a, a strange thing for me. I knew I wanted to paint. But 
you know, the galleries want to pigeonhole you to where if you get successful in one kind of painting, they want you to do that over and over and over again for the rest of your life. And so I was like panicked, like, oh my God, what am I going to paint? You know, there's so much stuff in the world that I love. And uh, uh, the very first show I did was this show. It was clear back in 2001, just as an experiment. I still had my design company. I was working. I had probably 40 different clients. And I took on this. And I thought, yeah, I can do this. So uh, I almost killed myself. So I was going on four hours sleep a night. I would come in here, work the whole time, take off, run home, get on the computer, do all of my stuff, schedule all of my meetings and everything around the evening times or in the morning. So sometimes I'd be driving down to Phoenix at a thousand miles an hour to have a seven o'clock meeting so that I could get approval on this project and then get back to the tent. And so I did that for 10 weeks and had a blast and, and I met some people that introduced me to the artist ride, the photo shoot in South Dakota. And at that time, I was just painting some things that I had, some photos from uh, some New Mexico dancers, uh, a lot of uh, uh, buffalo dancers and things that they would perform at ceremonies. And because that's what I knew growing up, you know, in New Mexico and thought that that was a little niche in the market there. I'd try that. And so then once I went to that photo shoot, I just was like, whoa, this is just great. The imagery, the stories from the 1800s, just endless, endless, you know, and then meeting all the great people and being out there sleeping under the stars in the teepee. And uh, it was just, that was everything. So I thought, okay, this is it. I'm good to go. And that was the end of that. I've been doing it ever since. Sounds like fun. And uh, how many reference photos? Well, I've got probably 15,000 or more photos from all these different places I go. And, uh, I, you know, I kind of started a little too late to get all this done. <laughs> you know, I was starting at 55 feet. And so um, I've, got a, I've got a file on my computer that's titled Before I Die. And so the best ones, when I'm going through, I'll take the best ones and stick them in there. Like, I got to do this. I got to do this one. I got to do this one. So now my before I die is probably about 5,000 photos. So, so uh, luckily, luckily my mom's almost 98, so I might have good enough genes that I can make it and get those things done. <laughs> and uh, I think you touched on this earlier, but what, what made you pick up clay and start doing sculpting? Oh, yeah, well... Kurt and the other sculptors around here, I, it was such a tease for me to walk around and, and see all this three-dimensional stuff. And I kind of watched everybody and how they would work. And then I saw uh, there's a little niche in the market there that nobody's doing small things that are really detailed. And my paintings are really detailed. So I thought, well, that fits in. It'll look like it belongs to me. And so then I started to do these really small little... <laughs> Uh, super detailed bronzes. I didn't know that, that that's what the foundry hates. And so, so I've, uh, I've walked into a hermit's nest of that. that Here like comes this that one, Galloway guy. Like this one, the Hopi girl sitting up on the ladder. And this is kind of unique uh, because she's just cantilevered up on the ladder there instead of building the whole rock building, you know, Adobe building there. I uh, just have the illusion of her being up there. And it started with just an old black and white photo from the early 1900s of a Hopi girl sitting up on top of a roof. So I had to visualize the rest of it and create it into a work of art. And so I had that to go by and then the story about this hairdo. This is only the Hopi do this and it's for the girls from when they hit puberty until they get married. It's called the Squash Blossom Whirl. And the mother will use a, a round piece of wood and uh, divide the hair up and lace it around that wood and then slide out the wood so it's just this beautiful cone of hair on the sides. And so it was to signify that they were available. So it helps them get hitched in the tribe. So uh, I just had the uh, thought that she's you know, a young teenage girl sitting up on the roof like a lot of teenagers 
they have a lot of time alone or they're thinking about their future and everything, they'll do the same with the Native Americans. And there's always chickens and dogs running around the reservation. So I put them in there and uh, actually use that to my advantage because the chickens right up against the ladder and the dogs up against the ladder. So it gave me a big blob of bronze that would strengthen the ladder to hold up all this weight so I could pull this off. So we didn't know if it was going to work all the way until the end. <laughs> Technical word blob of bronze. So speaking of bronze and clay, um, we can roll this over if you want, Kurt. Yeah. And yeah, I'll let you roll it because I don't want to take responsibility yeah. for it. But I asked, I asked, I asked Kurt to bring a clay piece up, and we can get that right, right in front of me or wherever. Yeah. You. you you're the star and he's the star. So let's talk about how this goes from there to there. Okay. When, uh, that's one of the most common questions and it's really hard to explain so that you get a hold of it. But in a nutshell, you get, this is an oil-based clay. It never gets hard. Okay. Some of my clay is like, you know, 30, 40 years old. When you're old, everything has lots of time in it. So I've got some really good clay here. And what you do is when you get the piece done, Okay, then what you're going to do is make a rubber mold from it. Now, this will entail, now think of a chocolate Easter bunny, except in, you're going to take a couple of pieces, you know, things like this arm will probably have to come off. And we're going to party down here. So this, I can't use my hands very good. This will come apart like this. The legs will probably come off. I'll make a mold for that, I'm guessing, but just to give you an idea. So you're going to paint this with rubber and put a plaster back. Then you're going to open it up, take the clay out. The clay is destroyed in the mold making process. So then you have the mold. You then take hot wax. You make two temperatures of wax. The first is, is hotter than the second. That first one you pour in, you put the two halves together. Well, you paint them two halves, put the two halves together. Then you put that hot wax in there, slush it around, pour it out, let it cool. And then you put the cooler wax in and let it build up to roughly eighth of an inch. And that's gonna give you a wax positive of this piece. Then it's retouched. That means you put it back together like it was in wax. Then they gate it, which means they're gonna attach some gates that will allow air to escape. And they're going to then dip it in a slurry and then put five coats or so of what's called investment. When it gets done, that wax looks like it has plaster all over it with these arms coming out and there's a cup. So you heat that up, the wax falls out, and you pour the bronze into that. That's and why it's called lost wax. Right. Then you're gonna chip that away, cut the gates off. Then they do what's called chasing, which means all the little textures they put back in. Like if a gate touched right here, they're gonna put that texture back in. One of the things that is so critical in terms of sculpture is to have a foundry that will take the time to make sure that you cannot see where they have touched it. It's a hard thing because I, I'll tell you a little story. When I first started, now this is 1983, and I didn't know anything. And I did my first piece and oh, you know, it's like, oh, good grief, this is so exciting. It's like, go to the foundry. And the foundry that we were using was the one that the, my mentor had recommended to me. The thing I didn't know was that they believed it didn't matter what the bronze looks like as long as you can't see it from six feet away. So, yeah, oops is right. So what you do is you walk in and I go, oh, good grief, you know, if they, let's say they had cut a patch in his back here that they, so they could make it hollow, okay, for casting. Put it back in, you weld it on. They would take a grinder and just smear all over it and you could see right where that patch was. But I didn't know any better. And so now that I'm old and wise, and now you look for foundries who can handle this stuff. And so you chase that, that metal back and then they do what's called the patina. And that is done with different chemicals and heat. So they're gonna heat that bronze up. And sometimes they'll use an airbrush. Sometimes they'll, they'll use uh, brushes. Depends on the patinor and how they wanna go about it. Different chemicals that will give you different colors. Kupik, for instance, will give you anywhere from blues to greens. Ferric will give you bright reds down to more of a browns. There's all kinds of nuance. Liver goes black, and you layer those colors on. And that's how you get the finished 
uh, color on the piece. Now for ropes and reins, like on that bridle horse over there, you fabricate those afterwards. If you cast them, they'll be too brittle. So what I have to do is show them how, here's how you tie a hackamore. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. How you set your rain chains go, that kind of thing. And make sure that they're tied on accurate so that, because if a buckaroo comes into my space, you know, here, and I'll tell you, and everybody, you know, if you know, you know. And if they see something a heck more tied wrong, they're going to know it. They're going to say, what's this? And there ain't nothing worse than that. I'll tell you what's funny, though. You'll get guys who come in there. Sometimes it's just guys, by golly, they're just going to show you kind of how much they know. And so they'll say, well, you know, in my day, and the bottom line is I don't know much, but I know this. And you can tell them, no, this is how it goes. And then you're okay. You've got to have that confidence. And when somebody buys one of my pieces, I owe it to them that that piece is dead on. Because there's nothing worse than walking into somebody's home and seeing a piece, and they've got a, you know, let's say they've got a team roper, and they put him into a ranch scene. Those two things don't go together. And so you've got to get this stuff right. And so your foundry has to be willing to work with you to make sure that it's all squared away so that that piece is dead on and that whoever buys my work is getting the best thing that I can do. And they're a part of that. And not every foundry can do that with my work. And each artist, you know, like with Randy, he has to find the right people for his because he, that's, you know, there's a lot in there that he's putting in. He wants to tell you that story. And the same is with Sarah, her textures, everything else in her pieces are the same way. So she's got to find people who are willing to take the time to make sure her statement is dead on. And so that all of that goes in to that finished piece. And like I look at the fin I look at the waxes, I check metal, I check everything as they go through. Because the guys at the foundry, they're, they're not horse guys. They're not cowboys. They don't know. So you've got to constantly be on that to make sure that it's dead on. Is that, good? that was well done. And it's, it really is a, a partnership and finding yeah. that right um, foundry. And this explains a little bit. Well, some people will say, well, why is bronze so expensive? There's a lot. And the price of metal has fluctuated quite a bit. But even, um, I'm just going to spin this around a little bit more because it's called looking ahead. But the base that you build, this will become. This will be a shelf. I just put the box there. And it, he'll sit on like a mantle shelf, a bookshelf, whatever. It's actually called Bunkhouse Scholar. Yeah. I wrote looking ahead on here because I didn't know piece yeah, of I, was, I thought yeah. that's not the name. No, but... well, you're, that's all right. But uh, this guy, this is Cowboy, I think 1800s, or pardon me, 1910. If you look at Cowboy, now let's say Trail Ride there, which was only 20 years, 1865 to 1885. And when you were on the range, a lot of the guys that heard of cows were illiterate. They didn't know how to read. But, they care, but the guys that did would carry books and they'd roll them up in their bedrolls. And so at night, there was instruments to play and there was books to read. Well, in 1910, the same thing would hold true. They would carry books with them to the bunkhouse because in wintertime, what you're doing, and this is true to this day, uh, you end up feeding cows, fixing fence, repairing gear. That's what you're doing. So you got time to read. And if you go down to the 06 today, and 06 is in West Texas, it's up Alpine, you go into Big Ben's Saddlery there. And the saddle shop, it was a great saddle shop. And you go in there and you have a big shelf and it's full of bucks. So the guys from the 06 or something, and the 06 is like a million plus acres, it's massive. But when they come in, they take the books that they want, they leave the books they've read, and they've got a big lending library going. So to this day, this kind of thing is important to the cowboy. So there's a lot of, some things change and some things don't. Absolutely. And um, I'll let you roll him back. Thank you. And you generally do editions of 20? I do nine or 20. Nine yeah. or 20. Okay. Yeah. So that means that out of that one particular piece, this one will be an edition of 20. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, if you order it in precast, you get a better price. And the, the lower the number left, typically the price might go up, just so you know. But you also paint and draw. Mm -hmm. And watercolor oil la, la, la. yep all of that allows me it's like with both that the, the bucket over there next to sarah's painting it's that guy his name's mark lundy he runs the spanish ranch he's cow boss up there that little gun horse he was riding was just fantastic i mean really a nice horse and he is a really good hand now you can see that flat hat 
his, uh, his chinks that he's got on, those are called Armidas. They're not chinks to Armidas. There's a little difference. I won't go into that right now. But here, I'm going to come over here. These leggings are called Armidas, okay? Goes back to the old Spanish, Paramas, which, which means to protect. So you got that. This is a, his Rayada here. Now, this is a real nice S shank. It's not a spade bed. It's called a half breed, which means it's just, it doesn't have some things that a spade has. Real nice. You can see the silver here on his on his uh, bridle as well. And these are Ramel reins and the rain change there. These are called a, a, a Manel stirrup that he's got on here. All of that, when somebody sees that piece, they're going to know he's buckaroo, all from that gear. Slick pork saddle, all of that. So they're very distinctive. That horse over there is called the veteran, the buckaroo that owns that horse. You can see these bronze conchos, spade bed, Santa Barbara spade. These are called get down ropes. You don't lead a spade horse by the range, you lead it by the get down rope because of the way the spade leads on a horse. This horse was so handy. You can see him listening back to his rider, watching off over there, and he just roped an old cow and was dragging him off. So it tells a really wonderful story. And the brass conchos are kind of cool. So there's all that stuff going on. So you can tell that then when you look at Sarah's painting, isn't that a great painting? I love that painting. It makes me drool when I look at that painting. <laughs> She's gotten everything really right on that. Captures the movement and the, the messaging going on between the cowboys yep. and the horses, which I love. It's great. So. We could go on and on, right? We could. But, uh, does anybody have any questions that you'd like to ask our panel, uh, Wendy? talking about his inspirations, the stories giving him art. So I'm asking Kurt, what gives you the reference or what creates in your mind what you are going to um, sculpt or paint? And I know you've got heaps of experience and maybe that's where it comes from. And I'm assuming with Sarah, you know, with your life and living as you have, you're getting inspirations from things you know. Is there other things that give you that connection between what you know and the art that comes out? And for Kurt, I have one other question. Does everybody that collects your art understand or has got experience of all that detail and knowledge of your subjects? They do if they've met them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Kurt just dreams this stuff. <laughs> it's there all the time. It's my little, my little pea brain. You know, here's what happens um, in terms of the inspiration. An awful lot of it comes from I grew up in this, and so I, I've lived this stuff. Part of it, though, also comes from like Randy with reading, because some of the stuff, there's an author named John Bosenecker who specializes in the Old West, California. He's written like 35 books. And so sometimes I'll read something in there and it'll say, oh, that sounds like a good story. Then you compose it in your head and you think, okay, how's that going to work sculpturally? And there's three things that I always put through my mind about a subject if I'm going to do it. First of all, it has to glorify God. Secondly, it has to educate. So there's something that's really important in it. And thirdly, it has to enrich. So the people's lives are enriched by having that piece of art. If it won't do those three things, I don't do it. So everything is filtered through those three things. And as far as telling everybody, what I do is, yeah, most of the people who buy my work do not have a clue about all that. So I, and you know, it's like Susan said, I can, I tell everybody, you know, I can bore people to tears with stories. Sometimes they'll just say, oh, I'll do anything to make it stop. It's, <laughs> It's, it's kind of like that, you know. But what happens is, I, we, I always tell them, but then we give, like Randy, which are, he, he's right on the money there, I think. He gives them a write-up, and I give them a write-up as well. So everything that I've told them, and it's so great, you guys. When somebody comes into your booth and says, you know, I love that piece, and I keep that write-up, you know, here or there, and they'll tell you where it's at, and they'll say, every time somebody comes over, I hand it to them so they can make sure and get everything that, in that piece. 
So that's where all of it comes from. It's a combination. A lot of it's from that. But it's real important to me that everybody knows and can just enjoy that piece. Because ultimately, here's the deal. Art should lift people up. We have plenty of things that will tear us down. They're happening all the time. We need something that's going to lift us up and that you can enjoy every day. And boy, I try to do that. That's a big deal. Absolutely. Good question, Sarah. There we go. Yeah, no, that is a great question because there's so many times that I'm out doing whatever I'm doing, watering something probably, and, and I'll see something but won't have a camera to catch it or a sketchbook nearby or now, you know, I'll have to actually use a visual memory, which we actually have as human beings. And, and so I'll try to take that back. But very often I'm in a place or I'm chasing an experience and, or like when I'm, if I'm out and helping my neighbor gather his cattle, which I did in September because my dad's, one of my dad's two cows got out. She doesn't stay in. So she left, we went together and I had one hand for the horse and the other hand for the camera. So the camera was going the whole time. So then I got back to the studio, go through all those pictures and tried to find those several dozen photos that caught the feeling that I had while I was there. And all of that ends up being a very much a design thing that you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to understand what goes into all the design, but it is so much fun as an artist when you see those things come together. Like this painting, for me, what I, one of the things I love about it is that it gets, it's got a radiating pattern in it. You've got a line that's coming in here. You've got all these lines coming in this way. You've got a sort of scatter shot there. And so everything's radiating to these two guys who are very successfully riding these very fast horses. And you can ride the chaos horse for just a little while and then you need off. But you've got, you, you know, you've got all these radiating lines here, but that's steadied by this fence back there. They're not, these horses are very much contained as well as out of control. And so, so those design aspects are part of what makes me excited from a painting perspective. Like what can I do to bring that into one painting that whether you understand it or not will give you some sort of an emotional response. And that's that's fun too if I try to paint a cow because yeah, okay, not everybody knows, you know, what eyelash of the cow needs to move when such and such happens. But nevertheless, you know, if you can take if you can take a little bit and it's like we all we spend so much of our lives reading each other's faces and expressions, and we don't necessarily realize that most other mammals have a lot of the same musculature and facial responses that we do to emotions. So, I mean, cats are a little odd. They don't have muscles for eyebrows. So you just have to forgive them for looking the way they do. But, you know, we read, we read our dogs that way. We know when they're happy or sad. And the same thing goes with horses and cattle. And horses actually read us the same way. So, you know, there's a lot that goes on in that. And so trying to make that intelligible is part of the mystery for me. It's like, okay, is, is, this, is this connecting? Have I made this horse, which people may or may never have petted a horse? Can I make this horse look happy or sad or inviting? That's, that's part of what makes me excited. So good, yes. And um, I love, you have several of these vertical pieces that are just brilliant when you're thinking about, you know, trailing a line of cows with the horse behind and you've got the, the visual. And um, I recently got your fabulous little backlit palm tree that reminds me of the photo I try to capture when I'm get, getting the sunset out in front of my house and you have like the saguaro with the cactus wren. And so excellent at capturing the light in the dark and, um, and the story. So Glenn, you have a, okay. Yes. Yeah. What well, inspired, I'm going to repeat that for the online. What inspired the one of the back side of the cows? Yeah. Well, that's because you don't want to get in front of a bunch of moving cows unless you really need to stop them. Uh, yeah. Because they can get going. Cows are a little funny. They are very curious. They're very movable. But if you get them going a little scared, they will run through anything and probably hurt themselves and maybe some other people and horses too. So you don't want to, you don't want to, you need to work with them in the way cows want to be worked with. And so partially, I mean, in this case, I was with my, you know, same roundup, 
getting my dad's cow and we're trailing them. We've got, they see us coming. They know what's probably going to happen because they, the neighbors use the same equipment every time. These cows have done this every year. They know exactly what's going to happen and they just go. They know where they're going. They follow the trail. So you just mostly stay out of the way until somebody does something wrong. And then you just push them back and you keep it all nice and calm, as calm as possible, because you don't want anybody to run and make everybody else upset. And hopefully the dog does everything he's supposed to do too. And in this case, the dog did. The dog was in my, and it's one of those situations where cattle know who belongs in the group and who does not. So my dad's cow was the one cow who did not belong in the group and they ostracized her and she actually didn't care whether or not they did because she just would go her own way anyway. So that dog was busy going and getting her and bringing her back. <laughs> and so, yeah, so, you know, you were just following the cattle because they know where they're headed and we were just all working together to get there safely because you don't want to wreck. <laughs> you don't want that to happen out on a range. Yeah, no, nah, no. Nah. Wow, there are some excellent life messages in that statement you just made. Work with people that want to be worked with, work together. Great analogy. So, um, yeah, what a concept. That's great. We, what well, we could learn from ranchers. One more question, and then I guess we'll wrap up. It's just a comment that I've lost my voice, but uh, I uh, was at the Western Spirit Museum and I spent a lot of time looking at every saddle and then there was no one to answer my question. I was like, how could any cowboy have a 60 foot riata? By the way, to put that in perspective, this is 50 feet. This tent is 50 by 50. So what they did when you think about 60 foot riatas, that comes from, they would braid them out of rawhide. What you do is you get a cowhide, stretch it, take all the hair off of it and stretch it, then you cut in circles and you cut strings, okay? So you have a knife and you cut all that, and then you stretch all those out and you braid it, you pull it through a, they'll drill a hole in a, so a really good riata maker, you know, they'll, they'll drill a hole in the post and they'll go through and they'll get it all polished back, you know? So that thing is just, Round and it takes all the little knots and stuff, all the little imperfections out of it. Then they'll tie on a hondu, which is a rawhide. That's your uh, the end that the rope goes through. They'll make a rawhide hondu on there, right? And then you coil it up. And if you do it right, those rayadas, you have to be kind of careful with them in moisture. You you keep a larger, you keep a fat on them to keep them uh, some of the moisture out because they have to keep a right amount of moisture is kind of critical. But those son of a guns, you think about if you go up to Jordan Valley. A, what's it, uh, Memorial Day weekend or the weekend after, I can't remember, there's what's called the Big Loop Rodeo. It's buckaroos from everywhere. It's in Jordan Valley is Eastern Oregon. It's out in the middle of nowhere. It's fantastic. But they rope the head and forefoot, these coats, okay, they're yearlings. So they peel them out of a chute and they're all 20 foot loops. That comes from roping longhorns, okay? And so they get out there, you know, and they, they go peeling after this old cow and they'll reach around and they'll snag an old cat, this, uh, this coat, and then another guy will come along and he'll lay a forefoot on them and lay them down. And that's how they would work with horses, you know, years ago on the range. But that's how you get a 60 foot bread. Excellent question and a fabulous answer. And it works really well because if you watch horses on the range, they can, they negotiate with each other and who gets to be leader based on who can move whose feet. So if you can move your horse's feet, you get to be leader. Wow, I, you guys are amazing, excellent, fantastic. Randy Galloway. <laughs> Studio is about midway, the North Tent, Kurt Matson around this corner to the left, and Sarah Fippen on the outside wall on the South Tent. Please visit their studios and thank you so much. You guys were amazing and so were all of you. And next week, we're gonna have some fun with art for our final finale of the 2022 Art Discovery. So thank you so much for being here and have a great weekend.